Thank you for joining me. For joining me, fun, me, fun. Huh? You're breaking up. We can barely hear you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, welcome everybody. I'm going to talk about the neurobiology of love. Um, is that coming in clear? <laughs> can you hear him? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'll do the best that I can. My name is Larry Young. I'm a professor at Emory University in Atlanta, and I'm a brain scientist. I study how the brain works. Uh, have you guys uh, studied the brain at all? You are little, you are little. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so, I'm interested in the brain, but I'm also interested in love and how does the brain create love. And uh, I just want to show you some slides to give you an idea of how we study that. Um, I love this picture here. This picture I use to illustrate the emotion that I study, which is love. We all experience love, different kinds of love. Um, some of that you can see here between the mother and the father and the baby, sort of parental love. This is something that you see in all animals, not just people, especially the mother-baby love. Um, but humans, we also have a different kind of love that's love between uh, partners, between the mother and the father here. Um, that you don't see in animals very often. Um, but people are very special in that way. So my question that I want to pose to you today is how can we understand how the brain creates love, the emotion that we call love? And how can we begin to study that? So I want to ask you guys a question. How do you think scientists can begin to study how the brain Creates in my mind. Anybody have an idea? Anybody have an idea? Observing the emotions. Uh, observing the emotions. Yeah. Observing, the, observing the emotions. That's the first, the first step. But how do you but how do you figure out in the brain? So you can say it's a difficult <laughs> to do. Actually, actually. Um, uh, there's a way. There's a way. So there so, is a machine called an fMRI machine that actually allows scientists to see what parts of your brain are activated at different times. So you can see this person is getting ready to go inside this big donut. And inside that donut is going to be magnetic fields. And those magnets actually allows the computer to rebuild an image of the brain and not only see your brain, but tell what parts of your brain are activated when you do something. So for example, imagine if, if someone were to um, someone were to put me in this magnet and then ask me to think about my children and how much I love my children. You could see what parts of the brain may be activated during that time. So look at this, for example. This is a real image. Uh, the top part here, this is just um, showing you the outline of someone's brains. And the color is showing you what parts of the brain are activated when this picture was taken. And here you can see it actually fit inside the skull. But to me, it's just absolutely amazing that you can go into a machine and you can think about something. And you can see what part of your brain is activated when you think about that. Now, isn't that pretty cool? Do you think people can actually know what you're thinking about sometimes? So it's like a CAT scan. So far, we, we can't really know what people are thinking about. Um, but this tells us what parts of the brain are activated at a certain in a certain time. But if you know something about brains, what is the basic building block of a brain? Neurons. Can anyone tell me? Neurons. Neurons, right. So neurons, a brain is really a big collection of a whole bunch of neurons that talk to each other. 
So even though that picture is kind of cool because it tells us, well, this part of the brain is activated when you think about your, your daughter that you love or your wife, or this, this part is activated when you... That's only part of the picture. I like to think about the neurons and how the neurons are talking to each other and how does that... How do individual neurons talking to each other create... Um, something as magical as love. So now I want to show you uh, something about neurons. So what's really going on? This is a neuron. Your brain is made up of millions of neurons. They're all connected together and they're talking to each other at these little things called synapses. This is the way neurons talk to each other. I sort of think of the brain and all these neurons as kind of like the internet, except way more complicated. There's a lot of information going from place to place to place, and a lot of information is going across in these, uh, these neurotransmitters that are released from one neuron onto the other neuron. And when this is released, it binds to these receptors. These little blue things are receptors. And if that is kind of like a lock and a key, if the neurotransmitter is released and hits a receptor, then the next neuron gets activated and the signal gets transmitted down through the system. Okay, so this is, so now we're getting down to thinking about um, the brain as being actually chemical communication between a bunch of neurons. But it's not just a random bunch of neurons. If you look in the brain, you'll find that there are collections of places, brain regions, that all do different things. So there are some parts of your brain, like in your hypothalamus, that makes you get hungry. Right? Right now you're all probably hungry, ready for your pizza. Part of your brain is making you hungry. There are other parts of your brain, for example, um, this little red area here, that is called the nucleus accumbens. That's an area that is activated every time you do something that feels really good. Maybe you eat a piece of chocolate, or you uh, ride a bicycle really fast, you do something exciting. So um, it's part of your, sort of the excitement part of your brain. You have other parts of your brain, like hippocampus, where you form memories. So you can think of a brain as kind of a complex machine that's got a lot of different brain areas that are all communicating with each other to create um, emotions and memories, okay? Now I want to ask you, um, can you see me now, or? Okay. Yes. All right, now I want to ask you, as a scientist, I have a question of, of how in the brain is this chemistry working and these different brain areas working to create an emotion like love or desire or pleasure or anything like that. How do you think that I can begin to see inside the brain what exactly is going on um, to create some kind of behavior? Any guesses? Because the machine that I showed you can only show brain areas that are activated. What if I want to go in and listen to the chemistry and manipulate the chemistry? You could, are you saying you I'll give you a clue. Oh, Our brains are very similar in terms of this neuroanatomy as animal brains. This is a, a little uh, vole brain that I'll tell you about in a minute. But if you look at the different brain areas, the parts of the brain that I have shown here, that are all connected to each other, these are all the same parts of the brain as we have. And they have the same neurochemistry. Have you ever heard of dopamine? Dopamine is a, yes, dopamine is a chemical that's involved in uh, arousal, pleasure. We have that. But also rats and mice have that. So almost every chemical that we have in the brain, these animals have the same. And the brain is organized in a very similar way. One big difference between our brain and the animal brain is this part up here. 
It's called the cortex. This is what allows us to think um, rationally and understand things that animals probably can't. But all of the underneath stuff, the subcortical regions, are almost all the same between humans and the animals. So I propose as a scientist that if you want to understand something like love that, experience, that humans experience, you can study in animals because we have the same kind of brain. Now, um, if we want to study love in animals, what kind of animals do you think we can study? Guinea pig. Guinea pig. Well, guinea pig well, mamas love their guinea pig babies, that's for sure. Um, we really have to study an animal that has something that we might think looks similar to love. So guinea pig is not a bad answer. Rats are, is a bad answer because rats certainly don't love each other. Mice don't really love each other. But these guys, I'll show you the, the animals that I study in my lab. My favorite animal. These guys are called prairie voles. Some of you may have seen these guys because your cats may bring one in uh, up to the door every once in a while. Um, they're little wild. They look like hamsters, but they're from, there'd be some in Texas and up into Iowa, Indiana, Illinois. But these guys live in families very similar to humans. They have a male and a female. This is the mama. This is the daddy. And this is the babies. In most animals, the daddy is out of there. He doesn't take part in rearing the offspring. But in humans and some portion of animals, the males and females work together. And there's actually a bond that's created between this mama and dad so that they want to work together. And they raise their offspring together. And so we study these animals to try to understand what chemistry makes them uh, form these kinds of bonds. And I'll show you an experiment that we can do in the lab. Look at these guys. So uh, this is in the middle is, a, is a, a, a male. And this is his partner. And this is a new female here. And we're asking, who, does he, who is he bonded with? Okay, and we take a little video, and you can see he's going to wander over here and visit this new female that's not his partner, and then he's going to come back over here and he's visit his partner, and you can see how he's going to behave differently between the two. This is called a partner preference test. This is the kind of behavior experiment we do in the lab with these animals. Now, you may not believe me that these animals love each other. Um, I wouldn't say they necessarily love each other, but they are bonded to each other. You see, that was not his partner. This is his partner. And you see, they, they like to interact with each other. They groom. Um, and so what I did several years ago was to ask, what is the chemistry in the brain that causes these animals to bond with each other? And the first clue came from people's work on a molecule called oxytocin. Have you ever heard of oxytocin? Yes. Yeah? Yes. You did? Yes. Excellent. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. Oxytocin is a molecule that hap that a mother, either in a rat or a human or any kind of animal, when they're giving birth, it's released from the brain and it helps the mother give birth. And after the mother gives birth, it also helps make the milk be ejected so that the baby can nurse and get the milk. But we also know that that same oxytocin acts in the brain to help the mother create a bond with the baby. This works in rats. It works in sheep. And uh, we think it works in humans the same way. We can't be absolutely sure, but we think so. So we thought that maybe oxytocin might be involved in the bonding between these partners. So we did this little experiment. We took a female. She never had a boyfriend. She's never been with a partner. And we injected her brain inject directly into the brain with this oxytocin and then exposed her to a male. And we found that that caused her to bond with that male. If we gave a blocker that would prevent oxytocin from working, um, we could actually prevent her from being able to form a bond with a partner.
So in that experiment, we can actually inject a chemical into the brain of these animals and make them form a bond. Isn't that cool? Okay, good. Hey, good. See your, I can't hear you, but I can see your uh, uh, um, understanding. Does anybody have any questions about that before I go to the next part? Questions so far? No. Okay. All right, now. So I showed you that those prairie voles form these bonds and that they, um, I could stimulate those with just injecting their brain with a chemical. But one of the really cool things about the, the voles is that not all voles are the same, just like not all people are the same. So I've been telling you about these voles called prairie voles, that they form this bond for life. And I can make that bond happen by injecting this chemical oxytocin. And that once that bond is formed, they live their life together and raise their offsprings together. And if we separate these partners from each other, the others get they get depressed. They get depressed from not being with their partner. But if we look at another species of all that looks the same on the outside, but there must be something different about the chemistry in the brain because these guys never form bonds. Uh, they have babies and the mothers goes off and have the babies by themselves, but the, the mother and father never uh, hang out together. Um, and there's no bond that forms whatsoever. So I became very interested in why is it that these guys can form nice bonds, but these guys cannot. Does anybody want to guess what is different between the guys that can form bonds and the ones that cannot? Some have oxytocin. No. So you think maybe the ones that can form the bonds have oxytocin and the other ones don't? That's a very good prediction. And that's what I thought at first too. So I looked in the brain and say maybe these loners, the ones who cannot form bonds, don't have oxytocin. It turns out they both have oxytocin. But remember what what do hormones or neurochemicals in the brain, what do they have to do in order to have an effect in the brain? Say it again. They have, they have to, to be released. 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 They have to be released. They have to be released, to be released. right? Yeah. And then once they're released, what do they have to do? They have to bond. They have to bind have to, to bond receptors, to right? Yeah. Um, so chemicals in the brain don't do anything by themselves. They, they have to bind to receptors. So this is an example of that. So you can see, for example, this is a neuron and oxytocin is released and it will bind to that. If it has a receptor on that neuron, it'll affect it. But other neurons that don't have receptors are not affected. Right? So some of you guessed that maybe prairie voles have a lot of oxytocin and metal voles don't. Or prairie voles release oxytocin and metal voles don't. Or the monogamous prairie voles have receptors and the non-monogamous species don't. Any one of those could be a hypothesis. Right? So I did some experiments to look at each one of these and what I found was really, really cool, I think. What I'm going to show you now is the brain of the where the receptors are. So in the brain, in the voles, we can take the brain and slice it. This is a very thin slice of the brain. Okay, so it's like the vole is looking at you. Okay, um, the dark areas are the part that binds to oxytocin. This is where the receptors are. So this one area right here, prefrontal cortex, has receptors in both. This area right here is a very magical area. It's called the nucleus accumbens. This is where I told you that reward. And reinforcement acts like pleasure. So the, the monogamous species, the one that forms the bond, has the oxytocin receptors in this area that is involved in pleasure. This area is also involved in addiction. These animals don't have the receptors there. So it's almost as if these animals are, are able to form a bond with their partner because the oxytocin is activating this area that's also involved in addiction. Okay. Um, yeah, and if we 
we can take these animals and inject oxytocin receptor blocker just in this area. So a tiny, tiny amount of this chemical that blocks those receptors in this area. And we find that these animals will no longer be able to form a bond. Or we can inject oxytocin in there and we can make them form a bond. So by doing that kind of work where we can actually go in and inject into different brain areas, different chemicals, we've identified not just oxytocin, but also dopamine and vasopressin and a whole chemical cocktail that's acting in the brain that create that emotion that we call love. Okay? Did you have a question? No. Okay. okay. So this is one. I just want to make one last point, if we have, since we have time. Okay. So I told you about a lot of experiments that we do in little animals, and we've identified oxytocin and vasopressin in these brain areas that are involved in reward, and we can see that those are involved in bonding in, in animals. Once we've learned that in animals, we can go back to people and ask the similar thing happen in people. And there was a study that was published just like last year where they gave men oxytocin in the nose, sniff it. And then they asked them to look at pictures of their partner. That's my wife on the screen there that I showed before. But they looked at pictures of their partner, and the oxytocin made their partner look more attractive, more beautiful to them. And when they had the people in the brain scanner, they could see that that nucleus accumbens, where the voles have the higher levels of oxytocin receptor, was activated in the men when they looked at their girlfriend uh, after sniffing the oxytocin. Um, so that's just to give you an idea of how we scientists uh, try to figure out something as complicated as the brain, uh, first by looking at the human brain um, and then using animal models to try to get a good idea of what's going on. And then after the animals, we can come back to humans and say, is that really going on? And I think that the voles are telling us something about the neurobiology of love. So I hope you enjoyed that. I'd be happy to, to, ask any, to answer any questions you guys might have. Questions? What form is the oxytocin injected? Say it louder so you can hear you. What form is the oxytocin injected? Can you hear that? someone repeat the question that's closer? He said, what form is the oxytocin in when it is injected? Oh, it's in a liquid. So we, we put it in, in a liquid when we inject it into the brain. But oxytocin is normally a peptide. So it's a little bitty peptide. And when you do injections in the brain, it's in a liquid. But people are doing experiments now in humans where they sniff it. And some of it can get into the brain and act on receptors in the brain. And we can ask, what does it do to a person? Next question. How do you get the... Uh, oh, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead How do you get it if it's in the brain? How do we get it? How Nowadays, get it? We, we synthesize it chemist by chemistry in a laboratory. Originally, it was identified from the brains of sheep um, a long time ago when we were, they were identified this chemical in the brain of a sheep that would cause uterus to contract. And that's, that's how they figured out it was involved in birth. Uh, but now, once we knew the structure, we can just, in a, in a laboratory, build the molecule. So we just buy it. I just buy it. <laughs> Somebody else makes it. Some chemist makes it. I'm not a chemistry. I'm, chemist. I'm a. Can you get that brain. at Walgreens? <laughs> <laughs> yes, can you get that at Walgreens? No, you can't get it at Walgreens. <laughs> you can get flowers at Walgreens, and flowers will stimulate oxytocin release, though. Oh, okay. So, why do some animals not have oxytocin? That's a good question. So the question is why do, well, most animals don't form this kind of bond, this partnership. Most mammals don't. So the question is why do some? And the answer, I think, is in some species, it takes both mother and father to help work together to raise offspring. Now, maybe in humans, it works best if both are working together. Or maybe um, in some animals, when it's uh, very difficult to find a partner. The easiest thing to do is when you find a partner, 
to stick with that partner, form a bond. So I'm going to show you, since you asked me that question. Sometimes it's very hard to find a good partner, so when you find a good partner, you need to bond with that partner. Right? Don't let them go. And a good example of this is this deep sea anglerfish. They live deep in the ocean. Dark, no light. Very difficult to find a partner. So you can imagine when a boy finds a girl, he better stick with that girl. And that's what he does. The males bite the females and never let go. So they stay together for the rest of their life. Um, it's not really an emotional bond. Maybe this is not oxytocin, um, but at least they stick together. So um, the answer to your question is it depends on, on the environment or something about the ecology of the animal. Um, if the ecology is such that it works better for the mother and father to work together to raise the offspring, then the brain chemistry will evolve in that animal species to create those bonds so that they do that. Question? Yeah. Another question. Another question. So, are we like naturally born with that? Like, as soon as we come out. Can you hear him? No, I need to repeat that question. Say us. Like, as soon as we come out, are we? Do we have oxytocin? Oxytocin, yeah. Naturally, when yeah. we're born. Yeah. Oh yes, we have oxytocin naturally when we're born. There's uh, studies in. Like in babies that show that when the mother and the baby or the father and the baby interact and looking into the eyes and, and sort of um, act synergistically or together, there's more oxytocin released in the baby. So I think that in the relationship between the mother and the baby, in animals like licking and grooming, but in humans looking into each other's eyes, gazing into the eyes, communicating, or causing release of oxytocin, and that helps build our brain so that later in life we can uh, form relationships better. So our, our whole life is an accumulation of this effect of oxytocin on our brain um, and eventually you know, sort of creates our ability to relate to others in a positive way. Awesome. Any other questions? Any other questions? Half of them are eating their pizza. Love the angler fish example. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I told him in the game that you showed on the screen. That, that's quite interesting. Um, so is that the same concept when they they, they, they speak of something like a, an aphrodisiac? Raise that. Say that question again. So is so the the the, the snipping of the into, uh, what is oxytocin. 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 Is that the same concept, you know, as we used to hear about uh, an aphrodisiac? Um, no, not really. It's a little bit different. So an aphrodisiac, it maybe is something that will bring a male and a female together and sort of get them uh, um, interested in each other right at that time. Um, whereas a bond is something that lasts beyond that. It's more of an emotional connection between two. Um, and I think that's a different. So the people, when the people sniff um, the oxytocin, they don't feel any different. They don't know that they're that they're sniffing that. Um, so it's not like you know something is not coming over them and making them like suddenly all of a sudden feel a bond towards another. It's much more of a subtle kind of feeling. It's kind of like a love like potion. Okay, we got it. Last question. When when spiders eat their mates, isn't it like when they eat it, is it like oxytocin like when they eat it and then they love the mate if they're gonna eat it like I don't really get it. <laughs> okay, you have to repeat that question. Have to repeat that question. When spiders eat their mate, is does that have anything to do with oxytocin? <laughs> No, probably not. Um, yeah, so I think that everything that we know about oxytocin is is, is uh, from vertebrates and above. Okay, so invertebrates may have a very very different system. It's very rare that invertebrates form bonds and in families, for example. 
oftentimes they just have the babies and just let them all go. So it's probably a very different kind of system. So that's a different kind of loving your partner than what we're talking about here. That's a loving to eat your partner. Uh, we're talking about loving to, to bond with your partner. <laughs> so I think it's very different. Invertebrates don't have the same brain systems that, that vertebrates do. <laughs> All right, I think that's awesome. Most of us are going to end up having to go to eat. Okay. I think you, okay. I think you spawned some research in, in, in some of these, uh, some of our guys. Oh, good. I hope you guys enjoyed it. <laughs> and enjoy uh, your thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, bye-bye. 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 Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you. Nicely done. That went great. Good. All right. Take care. All right. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.